Welcome to session one of Base Camp Trail with the Redemption Hill Leadership Journey Residency. My name is Al Barrera. I'm one of the pastors here at Redemption Hill, and I'm going to act as trail guide for you during this portion of your journey. Base Camp Trail is designed to assist you in discovering the basic ideas of what it means to be a maker of disciples, following the ongoing command of Christ seen in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Let me read what Jesus said here. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, at Redemption Hill Church, we embrace these verses not simply as scripture given to explain the expansion of the early church, but we embrace these verses as an imperative command given to all followers of Jesus for all time. We believe that each of us is to be a disciple maker. But in order to embrace this command, we need to begin by understanding of what that means to us and, and what it means to be an imitator of Christ, a, a learner of Christ, an apprentice of Christ. Think of the early church, and more specifically, think of the description that we see in the Gospels. When Jesus saw Peter and Andrew standing by the Sea of Galilee in Matthew 4, 18 and 19, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they did. In fact, the passage goes on to say in verse 22, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Now we know that he eventually invited more people to follow him. And for at least 12 of them, they would stay with him, doing what Jesus did, listening to his words, learning his ways for the next three years. It was an apprenticeship. It was on the job training for what it meant to live and to love like Jesus. The result was that when Jesus eventually left, when he ascended back to heaven, he confidently empowered those same disciples to spread his message of love and grace to both Jews and Gentiles. This is the model for our idea of making disciples. We want to produce individuals who see commitment to Christ as the ultimate personal goal. And we understand that it can't end there because it has to extend to a love for people around us. We want to nurture a love for people who, if they could just meet Jesus, because of our own stories of salvation, our understanding of what it means to be saved, we know they too could experience image-defining life change and transformation. And that's the goal of making disciples, transforming growth from a relationship with Jesus. We crave the opportunity through our lives and through our existence to have an eternal impact on people in the situations that surround us. So with all of these ideas in mind, let's begin by diving into our first study together of something called the Imago Day. And let's start off with an easy question. What is the ultimate mission of your existence? I could phrase it another way. Why are you here? I mean, this is a basic existential question, right? That philosophers and theologians have been asking since the beginning of time. Why are you here? And we, we need an answer to that at some level, right? Because our answer to this question, more than any other single factor, shapes the trajectory of our lives. If you don't have a compelling answer to the question, you'll likely sleepwalk through life, either pursuing things you, that don't matter or not pursuing anything at all. This holds true to both Christians and non-Christians alike. All people need a purpose. How would you define your life's mission in one sentence? And, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it. We're going to pause here, take a couple of minutes, write down a beginning, just a start to what your life mission might be. So for me, I defined it in this way, and this is definitely a work in progress. Here it is. I want my life to inspire people to give Jesus more than a passing thought and for God to be glorified because I joyfully existed on this earth. You know, since this is such a big question with so many implications for our lives, it's important that we ask a more foundational question, isn't it? What does God say about my life's mission? As Christians, we believe that God is the author of all created things. We also believe that because he created all things, 
he has the right to define the purpose of his creation. In his kindness, he's given us scripture that allows us clarity in this matter. And in Psalm 139, 14 and 15, the psalmist describes part of the purpose in this way. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. The God who made you, the one who created all that is and all that ever will be, knit you together in a specific way to showcase his glory. He made you fearfully. This means he took great care. He was thoughtful that you were designed in just the right will to fulfill your purpose according to his will. He made you wonderfully. He took time to shape you in a way in which you could live as a unique reflection of his creativity and power. Your created design, our created design, informs everything about our life's mission. Since we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we are to take care to use our lives to their fullest potential, maximizing our individual abilities, our gifts, our relationships to best address opportunities that God has given us. And this returns to a basic idea with significant ramification. Everyone is created in the image of God, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, disability, socioeconomic standing, any other factor. Through the years, writers and thinkers have attempted to summarize exactly what it means to be created in God's image. Obviously, the image of God That Latin term, imago Dei, doesn't mean that people physically look like God, like a a child who has the same physical attributes as a certain parent. Instead, think about it this way. Being created in the image of God allows a certain relational capacity that allows people to know and relate to God in a different way than other parts of God's creation. Um, A houseplant. A dog or a cat does not live in an existence of self-awareness in the same way that humans might. So the nature of the Imago Dei may be more than a certain trait that humans possess. It likely also includes an action to which men and women are called. As image bearers, we are all meant to reflect God's countenance, his personality, his character of love and grace and mercy. Not only can we relate to him in unique ways because we are created in his image, but our mutual relationship is meant to allow us to reflect him in the world around us. Think about it this way. In ancient times, kings would often erect statues of themselves scattered around the kingdom to remind people of his presence. And this was purposeful. He wanted to remind everyone, including conquered lands and tribes, of who was in charge, who was in power. He also set these statues in place to remind people of who was there to protect them from less benevolent rulers. Yes, the statues were set in place as a reminder of authority, but also as a reminder of care, protection, and relationship. God sets up representative image bearers throughout his world today to remind the world of the true king, of his true character, of his greatness, of his love, of his mercy, and we are reminders of a king who desires relationship. Now, at first glance, it may seem that bearing God's image is impossible. Human sin means that men and women are incapable of representing God as proper image bearers. All people are born in the state of sin, and as a result, are cracked reflections of the image of God. I mean, think about Romans 3.23, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But as we remember where we were in sin, we cannot forget who we are now because of the righteous character and the righteous sacrifice of Jesus. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, as a substitutionary sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. You see, apart from the grace of God, we would be trapped between the mission we are meant to pursue and our inability to do that very thing. We'd be forever unable to do what God created us to do. But God is gracious. He sent his son Jesus as the perfect reflection of the image of God. 
So Jesus serves as an example, but also serves as our substitute. He lived the life that none of us could live and died the death we all deserved. By grace through faith, his death credited to the account of his people, they no longer have to fear the eternal wrath of God since it's already been paid for in Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 states it well, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. When God looks at his children, when he looks at you and me, he sees us as forgiven, as pure, as holy. God dwells in his people through his Holy Spirit and allows them to do what they were created to do in the first place, be the image of God. This understanding helps us connect the dots between Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and our life's mission. The final question is simple and follows naturally from what we've established this far. Are you reflecting God effectively? Or said another way, are you fulfilling God's mission for your life? In order to answer this question, we've got to establish just what it means to be the image of God. And perhaps the most natural way to answer this question is to look at our lives and assess whether our lives demonstrate the glory of God. Do those we regularly encounter notice a real difference in our lives because of God's saving work? Does our work ethic demonstrate we are honoring God through our efforts? Does our attitude, our actions, our reactions in the face of suffering demonstrate we have a greater hope than anything this world can offer? Does our everyday language, what we emphasize as important, demonstrate a commitment to our relationship with Christ? We could assess our life's mission using these and many other similar questions. And in each case, we'd be asking how well we reflect the glory of God and the transformation he's done in our lives. In our world today, it would be foolish for us to assume people would be drawn to worship our good God if his people did not reflect his glory through the everyday small patterns, events, and realities of life. So the other aspect of our image bearing nature and one that we cannot minimize is the role we have in declaring the message of Jesus and the glory of God. The reality is that most of those people around us may observe someone living a God honoring life and simply think that this person is being a good person. They'd assume like a coworker, a neighbor, a friend is moral or upright but not understand the connection between this person's actions and the work of God through Jesus to transform their hearts. Unless we overtly speak about Jesus and connect the dots between our lives and Jesus saving, redeeming work, then we've neglected a vital component of our image bearing work. And not only do others need to understand this connection, they need to be shown how they too can find new life in Christ as well. So what's the challenge for us today? What will it look like for you to live daily as one created for a purpose? What would it look like for Redemption Hill Church to exist in that way? Demonstrating and declaring the gospel when combined, provide the proper definition of what it means to bear the image of God. The outworking of these actions is gonna look different for everyone. Of course, the gospel message is the same but you may present it in a different way depending on your context, your friends, your neighborhood, your job. Every day, men, women, and children around us move through life without knowledge of the glory of God, without even realizing that they were created for so much more. Christians who have been taken captive by the glory of God are given the gracious privilege of being an image of His glory to these very people. Until the day Jesus returns, remember, you are an image bearer of the Most High King. Live in that reality, thrive in that identity, and reflect His image to those around you today. Our next session, Spiritual Formation. Until then, smile and shine Jesus on the faces of those you meet.